I'm hoping that this might be of some use for those of you that are interviewing. Uh, it's proved to be quite interesting for me. I've been using communication techniques more or less all of my uh, academic life, which is now fairly long. Uh, I've never really considered uh, the research methods that uh, uh, I, I apply when I study organisations to be subject to the theories that I've been using to explore organisations, but uh, uh, this seems to be somewhat meta uh, level of uh, representation. But I had a realisation uh, some time back uh, for a particular project, a uh, contract research project in Hong Kong uh, called the MTR project, uh, where we were interviewing managers from, uh, that were uh, from Hong Kong. They were uh, Cantonese speakers. And uh, I started to think about how do I ask questions and how do I understand or interpret the responses from these interviewees, given that they're not the same culture as me, despite the fact they could speak very good English. Uh, so uh, I started to think about this and uh, used a favourite kind of resource uh, called genre uh, and a particular kind of genre called canonical genre uh, to actually think about uh, how to organise the questions and how to, how to reason about the responses I was getting from the interviewees. So I'll talk to you about this. Um, I've recently published a book on this called, uh, and I'll have, to, I'll have to read it so that I don't get it wrong, uh, Elicitation Strategies for Interviewing and Field Work, Emerging Research and Opportunities. I can never remember the subtitle because the editors gave it to me. <laughs> but this presentation is basically a redaction of some of the ideas in that book. Uh, you can buy it, uh, there'll be a link uh, later on and uh, you can just uh, <laughs> QR code that link and you'll be straight onto that website. So the existential angst slide I call it, which is uh, 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 what, do I, what do I do? I, I do quite a lot of things. So I'm uh, a discipline leader for operations, so I'm a director for a laboratory called the Collaboration Laboratory, which is currently housed at the Smart Infrastructure Facility. Uh, I'm a co-director of uh, this august uh, research centre, the uh, Centre for Responsible Organisations and Practices that are sponsoring this uh, event today. I manage a thing called the Business Research Lab, which is a mobile uh, usability and observational research lab for the faculty. Uh, I'm, uh, my background is information systems and I'm a fellow in information systems at Karlstad University in Sweden. We've got a few things to run through. I would really like you to keep all of your questions to the end. Uh, it's being videoed, as you can see, for our students. It would be nice to have uh, a clean presentation. I welcome uh, your questions after it anyway. We've got a number of things to run through, but the first, I think, uh, most importantly, uh, is some information about, well, interviewing is a venerable technique. Why mess with it? And. Uh, uh, it's true, it's a foundational technique for qualitative research. Uh, even for mixed methods research, it's likely to be the qualitative method that you use in a mixed methods design. But it is certainly uh, for uh, management applications, which I know a little bit about, operations uh, uh, applications, which I know a bit about, and also information systems applications, which I know quite a lot about, uh, all involve interviewing um, to start to find out uh, what people know and what they need. And it's true to say if you've ever hung around people that are interviewers, that experience matters. Uh, uh, I'm going to explain to you uh, that. Uh, uh, certainly I think of myself as a good interviewer now, but when I started I was a bit rubbish. Uh, I'm going to explain to you a couple of my colossal failures, including actually I think the shortest interview in all history, which didn't even last the first question. Wow, okay, so that's some of the land speed record for failure, I should imagine, in interviewing. Experience matters, uh, but there are some really innately good interviewers, I think, who just have an ability to deal with people and make them comfortable and can extract uh, quite a lot of information from them. Unfortunately, there's very little practical advice on how to do interviewing. If you read 
uh, as I have read a, a lot of IS books which talk about interviewing as a technique, you tend to get kind of motherhood statements like turn up on time and, you know, wear a suit, you know, which is a pretty low bar for, for, for eliciting, I would imagine. <laughs> Um, look presentable, turn up on time. Mm, okay. Uh, the reality is when you look at how, how these texts look at interviewing, they are actually referring to a particular theory uh, which you find everywhere in the business arts and also in information systems, which is Shannon and Weaver's, uh, well, it's primarily Shannon's process model of communication. Uh, again, <laughs> it's, it's at the heart of most problems in IS, as far as I can see. But it is also at the heart of communication uh, theories in communications and cultural studies and other areas in marketing and so on. And it's criticised heavily in the social sciences for good reason. I will go through some of the reasons. Um, I, as an IS researcher interested in communication theory, had Shannon up on the wall, if I, if I would throw darts at something, metaphorically at least, it would be this guy. But he was nonetheless brilliant. Claude Shannon was a genius. And he saved Bell Labs at a time when Bell was actually developing telephone networks. The problem for Bell Labs is they did not understand the business they were in. They couldn't capacity plan these networks that they were rolling out, these telephony networks they were rolling out, because they couldn't measure capacity. They couldn't measure their business, their core business object, which was information as it turned out, they couldn't measure. So Claude Shannon actually figured out a way of doing that. And if you've heard of a bit, then that's Claude Shannon's invention. Genius. This guy got rolled out for the really hard problems in Bell Labs and Bell Labs were dealing with hard problems. He was quite a character to read uh, about. The problem is that this information process model of communication, which applies very well for telegraphs and telephones, is actually irredeemably flawed when it comes to, to trying to think about how communication works with humans. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things which are uh, implied by this, uh, or actually explicit in this theory, which mean it's impossible to apply to human communication. I'm going to run through some of them. There's not all of them. One of the reasons this is a flawed account is that meaning is completely absent. Shannon and Weaver, well, Shannon's model of communication has nothing to do with meaning at all. So there's no semantics in this model. So all those people in marketing and management that want to use this process model of communication to explain anything about, you know, reach or anything to, about their audiences are actually not really uh, explaining that. Right. Um, another problem is that uh, messages for Shannon in Shannon's model, which works well for telephones, is that everything that you need to know is in the message itself. Those of us that know about human communication understand that it's deeply contextual. That is, there are things in the environment which provide meaning to a message. I can take a message like Shannon and apply it in a different organisation, for example, and get a completely different meaning. Okay? So messages are contextual. The meanings of a message is contextual. There is this impoverished notion of sender and receiver in this model. Senders have all the power. They're the ones doing the talking. They're the ones that are doing anything at all. The receiver is just simply a passive lump at the end of this half turn taking. You know, it's not even a turn taking model of communication. There are actual and implied information and power asymmetries in this model of communication which are literally unexplorable from the perspective of Shannon's approach to communication. And the only content that counts is the informational value of a message. That means I could show you, I, I tried to actually do a slide but I'll, I'll just explain it to you, a square that looks like white noise and a, mess, uh, and a picture of a young baby, these would be exactly equivalent in, Shannon, in Shannon's perspective. The informational value in those messages, in those pictures, would be the same. A semantics for you, okay? Uh, there are numerous other problems with the theory. You could write books on why you shouldn't apply it to human communication. 
Uh, but suffice to say that this is enough for it to, to invalidate it as uh, an approach to interviewing, in my view. So what's an alternative? What, al what sort of alternatives are available? Well, I reckon interviewing is really a, a kind of communication, so let's use a communication theory. If we go down this particular path, then, you know, how do we proceed? And the first step I would take is to reverse all of the obvious flaws in uh, Shannon's view of communication and try and fix them. Create, if you like, a set of design features for a communication theory to apply it to interviewing. So the first is I would try to foreground meaning. I would try to have an account of interviewing that included context. I would also try to provide alternative accounts for the relationship between interviewer and interviewee. So I could uh, uh, look at this in, a, in a, a more balanced perspective than Shannon can provide at all. I want to account for information and power asymmetries. This is what organisations are full of. We need to be able to describe them. Uh, we can't do that with his model of communication. We can with others. And I also want to dig into the nature of the messages themselves. So I want to look at structural and semantic aspects of the communication. That means I really have two alternatives. If I want to look at modern communication theories, a la 20th century, I've only really got two alternatives. The first one you've probably heard of, Chomsky and linguistics, right? Now, um, if you go down to computing science departments, they love Chomsky. Why do they love Chomsky? Because it's a view of communication, a view of language comprising rules. And what's useful with rules? Well, computer systems are useful for rules. So it's not surprising that this is actually the foundation theory, transformational grammar as it's typically referred to, is the foundation theory for looking at any kind of computational linguistic task, including parsing, uh, including compiling. Uh, so down there, Chomsky rules. And uh, yeah, fine, okay. But if you want to apply, if you want to look at Chomsky and linguistics and try to account for human communication, it's irredeemably flawed, a little bit like Shannon. Uh, I've read a marvelous book recent, recently, recently uh, by a guy called Vivian Evans, uh, a Welsh linguist professor of linguistics. Uh, and he, he systematically goes through every aspect of Chomsky and linguistics and debunks it. The worst is that pseudoscience. It's not, actually a, it's not actually coming out of any empirical understanding of communication at all. There's no empirical data. It's all a bunch of presumptions, basically. And everything else is flawed as a result. Now, if we're looking at 20th century linguistics, Chomsky linguistics was really popular in the first half of the, of the century. In the second, towards the end of the 20th century, an alternate approach came to the fore, and that's functional linguistics. That is an attempt to understand language from the perspective of humans, how they use language to make meaning. That's what a functional linguistics is. And there we have quite a lot of uh, approaches, and I think we have a lot of approaches as a consequence of the Chomsky linguistics that came before it. Uh, an attempt, lots of attempts to try and find meaning in communication. But the reality is, if you want to account for the structure and function of communication, you need a complete model of language. You need one that, enca that encapsulates every method you need in order to unpack any stretch of communication at all, and you need to be able to understand the relationship between that utterance or text, completed active communication, and the context in which it's occurring. And there's really only one to choose from. One that was developed by an Englishman in Australia called Michael Halliday. Halliday in linguistics is known as systemic functional linguistics, and so that's what I chose. So the first thing to get around this acontextual nature of an utterance is the fact that any kind of text, any completed act of communication, including interviews themselves, sit within a particular situational context 
And that situational context provides values about what's happening, who it's being done to, what their power relationships are, and, and also how that interview is being conducted, how it's manifest in language. All aspects about the situation in which that communication takes place. That's cool. A very unusual feature is that it's got a second context sitting on top of that. And that's referred to as the cultural context. And this provides a sort of a pattern to the interaction, which is indexical of the kind of culture you're in. That culture could be an organizational culture, it could be a national culture. I'll give you an example of, of this. It works out that this interviewing techniques that I've developed, this elicitation strategies as I call them, actually are all based around this resource genre. Okay. Now I'm going to provide you with two really uh, very average, actually failed interview situations, and they're mine. I'll own them. And I've spent, oh well, one of them <laughs> I think was just because I was uh, an idiot young interviewer, right? And, and wasn't aware of who I was interviewing, uh, which accounts for that failure. But the second failure was really tricky to figure out. Uh, and it took me a long time to figure it out. I eventually wrote a paper on it. Anyway, so the first interview was with a young IT manager, recently appointed IT manager. I won't tell you which local business it was involved with. I went up to this guy. I said, how are you implementing this great system? And he sort of looked at me and he said, well, we use a particular fourth generation language. Well, I won't name it. My response was, that's great. I teach exactly that tool in my prototyping subject, right? And literally, you could see this guy just going, shut down. And he said, well, you don't need me then, do you? And he walked off. <laughs> OK. I didn't read this guy. So I should have been able to see that this guy was defensive. Uh, he, was, he was a bit worried about being interviewed by me, particularly you know, somebody from the university, like we know anything, right? Okay, so maybe that was playing on his mind. Uh, and he really didn't want to be interviewed. That was the other thing, so he just walked. And I was a, you know, not, a lot of, not a lot of way of repairing any interaction like that. But that was down on me. That was stupid, you know, just blurting out stuff. Uh, being excited, I was genuinely excited. I understood exactly what this guy was, was doing, I felt. But of course, I shouldn't have come across like that. This one was with a warehouse uh, manager, very senior manager, had, had risen from the shop floor, so a sweeping warehouse, all the way up to now running this warehouse at the end of his career for the last 12, 15 years, I don't exactly know how many. He, he, he was managing this warehouse. And I asked him a warm-up question. And the warm-up question was, how do you put things into the warehouse and how do you take things out? It's called binning and, uh, picking, binning and picking, the two operations. How do you bin an item into the warehouse? How do you pick an item from the warehouse? Both of us knew this was, this was like a stupidly simple question to, to ask. And it should have been dispatched like this. He would have felt a lot more relaxed and then we would have gone on with the interview. It didn't work out that way. He, uh, we were videoing, much as we're doing now, videoing this interview. And because uh, it was for a multimedia case study. And this guy literally choked. Sort of started, oh, well, you know, how you bin an item is, you know, you, you, the items come into the warehouse and then you sort of, make sure that you can, you're expecting them, then you scan it, and then maybe you put it onto the, the forklift truck. No, that's not right, he says, and backtracked that. He says, oh, can you, can you erase that bit off the video? Yeah, sure, just let's keep on going, right? Six or seven times after this, we had to just shut the interview down. He could not remember a thing. And it took me ages, it took me years to figure out why such a simple question elicited such confusion from this guy. So I'll leave that as a dangling. I've got an answer for it. Anyway. All right, so the first thing is um, about the particular resource I'm using, which is a genre, but a particular kind of genre called canonical genres. The genre is like a pattern that we use. We use this when we're trying to uh, uh, make ourselves understood 
to somebody. We use this when we're trying to actually uh, conduct business. And uh, genre are in fact a kind of social capital. We learn about how to do these things in schools, in churches, in clubs, anywhere there's institution and a particular kind of language to speak. This is where we learn genre. So if you get a job at a university, one of the things you might have to do is raise an order for something, right? And the way in which that's done is not universally identical. Each university's got their own little particular quirk about it, but it's in general similar. You've got something that you want to get. You need to have resources to get it. You need to talk to somebody so that they can issue this order on your behalf and then eventually you might get it. Sound familiar? But every institution does it slightly differently. So the stages that you go through, the stages that I just explained there, are a genre pattern. It's a pattern. If I want to go and shop, I'm likely going to be using a service encounter. I might use this 60,000 times or more during our, li our lives. We might do a service encounter a couple of times a day for five days a week, say. All right? Imagine how many cups of coffee, right? Every one of them is conducted in the same fashion, more or less, uh, with elaborations. And that structure, that staging of uh, long black please, two sugars, you know, yeah, I'll have one of those rolls, right? And that'll cost me so much money and I'll scan my little rewards card and all of that. That pattern you can do in your sleep. And in fact, actually, you can do it even in the absence of any language whatsoever. So uh, one of the first occasions I went to Copenhagen, uh, it was about minus 10 with a wind chill. It was horrible. December, no light any time during the day, more or less. Walking across the river, which is the coldest part of Copenhagen, looking for a bakery. I was 32 hours on a plane. I was very jet lagged. I needed something to eat, right? I eventually went to a shop. It was a bread shop. It was open at about 6.30. Fantastic. I'm going to get some Danish. Yeah, how about that? That'd be great, right? Uh, I, I stormed into the shop, caught the eye of a, of a shop assistant, and they literally ignored me. Ignored me. I thought, 32 two hours on a plane, I'm in Denmark, they must tell I'm an Australian. You know, I, could, you know, I wasn't dressed right either, so I was probably looked like a tourist. How dare they, you know. I was really angry, so I, thought, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. All right. So I stepped away from the counter and went back out and sort of had a look at the situation. And I noticed as people were walking in, they were picking up tickets from a vending machine, just slightly, and they were waiting for their number to be called, and then they were being served. I had never seen that outside of a bank, right? You still don't see that very often here, All right? So my knowledge of my failure in that case of not being able to buy bread immediately kind of said something from a practice perspective, right, about what to do. I was doing something wrong. I knew I was doing something wrong and I could amend it. I could modify that pattern, my understanding of how that pattern should work <coughs> and be able to do it. Another one is uh, uh, when I was younger, I used to spend a lot of time in the Netherlands in Twente University, um, student accommodations. And in the student accommodations, they, there was also a supermarket. And uh, I was starting to get pretty good at genres by then, and I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to see if I can conduct an entirely nonverbal shopping experience through the sh shopping centre. Uh, the only trick was, of course, handing over a large enough denomination at the counter so that uh, uh, you know, it was covered <laughs> for the cost of the items I was buying. But of course you can. You can, com you can conduct a completely nonverbal exchange partly because of the way the place is designed, partly because of uh, familiarity with genre. All right. Okay. So what do genres look like? Well, they've got some components to them. We can represent these patterns using elements. So for example, if I want to buy a loaf of bread in Copenhagen, I might say, hi, how are you? And the person at the back of the counter might say, very good, thank you, because they can speak English as well as you can and then you start the, 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 the genre off. So genres consist of elements that are connected together in a sequence. And occasionally you get alternate sequences. So for example, if I want to borrow a book but I'm not a member of a library, I have to go through a, uh, a sequence that will enrol me as a member of the library and then I can borrow the book. 
I can represent any instance of uh, completed active communication and its genre stages as a sequence of genre elements linked one after the other. But then once I understand that genre and all of its permutations, I can more or less add these sequences together to form a kind of directed graph or digraph. It's quite simple, I'll show you how to do that. And there are other properties that, that come about. I can skip elements. I don't need to say, hello, how are you, if I don't know you. As a server, I'm just going to, you know, provide you with a loaf of bread and wait for you to tell me how much it costs. I don't have to say hello. But if I know you, I might. Um, all of this is based on what I call a communicative conjecture. That is the staging of the work practice. If we think of buying a loaf of bread as a work practice, that can be revealed through the generic organization of the communication. It kind of leaves a shadow. The, the structure of the work practice leaves a shadow that you can see, actually, from the communication. So by taking a transcript and analyzing for genre, you can actually reveal the stages of the work practice. All right. So here's a notation. It's similar to a lot of computing notations because like I'm an IS person, right? So it's, a, it's going to consist of stages, uh, those genre elements arbitrarily named. So I've got a beginning and an end. That's a sequence, a sequence of elements, the generic pattern of my particular completed act of communication. But if I'm looking to try and see how my sequence relates to the canonical genre, I can see that there's some matches going on here. So this would describe all of the ways in which you could conduct a particular kind of work. It's a directed graph. So it shows, uh, in this case, this particular instance conforms to this particular genre because of the elements that are matching. Uh, arrows like this means that C, whatever that is, because this is hypothetical, could be bypassed. That stage could be bypassed. And still you would have you know, your loaf of bread or your book or whatever it was that you were buying. So there's really, what is genre? Well, what it's associated with is a way of organizing speaking and writing. And also it helps us listen and read because it's predictable staging. Think of all those incredible reality TV programs that are on at the moment. And they have a particular kind of narrative structure to them. They're, they're, they're like actual narratives. There's good people and bad people and there's editing that makes them look good and bad. And we all kind of love it. We've seen it a million times and we still get a kick out of it. It's a generic form. Now, with language-based genres, we can analyze them to find their particular way in which they're organized. For example, a particular way of buying items in a supermarket in the Netherlands. Or we can qualitatively infer the staging. We can figure out the staging by listening, by qualitatively associating a bundle of individual messages together to form a particular kind of meaning. Could be a greeting, could be a, could be a payment, could be a request for service. It's the second form that I'm looking at. <laughs>